My name is Vittorio Bertacci. You already know from which state I'm from. And uh, um, I work as an architect in of Zero. And uh, today I'm going to close this uh, uh, track by discussing uh, the many ways in which uh, reality might uh, look different from your uh, initial hopes and expectations and how you can use uh, uh, extensibility in uh, identity tools uh, for actually uh, somewhat accommodating for these uh, changing conditions. First, I'm going to describe what is the nirvana of uh, an identity uh, solution, as in the absolute best condition. You go to your customer or you go to your uh, uh, current uh, um, engagement, and uh, um, that's the thing that you want to see. That's the thing that gives you the least amount of friction. And then uh, we look at all the ways, well, many ways, in which uh, uh, this thing might not be true, and uh, the things that you might need to do, the techniques that you could use for accommodate this difference in uh, reality versus expectations. So in an ideal situation, what you have is a set of I lost the screen. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Windows P. <laughs> what could have happened? Ah, magic, I fixed it. What do I win? All right. As I was saying, in an ideal situation, what happens is that you have uh, a set uh, of uh, um, resources that you, ec that you expect uh, to access, web applications, APIs, and similar. And uh, you have full control over these uh, uh, resources. And you have uh, fixed ways of consuming those resources using uh, perfectly standard tools, perfectly standard devices, and similar. And the places from where you are getting identities are all supporting uh, exactly the protocols that uh, your various devices are using, both whether you are going through enterprise sources or whether you are going from uh, uh, any other source of credentials. And everything happily talk to each other with uh, no constraints. And although it's common to have uh, this kind of uh, connections in which uh, from your application you go straight to the identity provider, a, a very, very common pattern is instead to have something in the middle. Typically, like today we call it authorization server. A few years ago we would have called it security token service or LCS. The main point is that uh, from a functionality perspective, you typically have your clients come to the central place. The central place uh, is a demultiplexer with uh, uh, the various providers that you want to use. And then the outcome is that you get back something like a token and similar and you make your call. And in an ideal world, the a technology that you are uh, relying on for this uh, actually can talk to all of the identity providers that you want to talk with right out of the box. But of course, this never happens. Or it's not that it never happens. It happens in simple situations, but as soon as uh, you start working with uh, existing systems as opposed to blue ocean uh, green field strategy in which you just uh, choose whatever you want. If you keep doing this, I will keep up to <laughs> pause. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, and typically what happens is that there is an existing population of users that you want to migrate and uh, the, the, the population that lives somewhere. So assumptions that you might have about identity sources are that uh, if you are using these uh, authorization server in the middle, and you have a specific places from where you want to get identities, those places are the ones that are directly supported. Ideally, there is a little switch which say, I want to use Facebook, and this thing connects you directly. The next level is, OK, they are not directly supported, but at least they use a protocol which uh, was designed to connect exactly in those scenarios in which I don't have explicit uh, trust relationships, which also is uh, uh, debatable. Let's say that the, the standards are there, but they are not necessarily um, widely adopted or adopted by the book. So there are always little differences that you need to accommodate for. And then if you have something like an existing uh, credential set, 
somehow there is the assumption that you can take these users and move them to, the, to your new system. And very often, that is really not the case for a number of reasons that uh, we'll dig. The other assumption is uh, um, the fact that uh, whatever a pre-existing system that you are leveraging for authentication is uh, um, something that actually is somewhat standard. As in, uh, you, might, you might have a homegrown application which does authentication, but typically, these systems, uh, if you wrote them from scratch, will uh, conflate with authentication lots of other things. The typical things you'll find with it are uh, subscription management, for example. So you end up, uh, uh, when you substitute that model with a standard authentication system, you might find that uh, authentication is not enough. They st they, your customer still needs to deal with uh, payments, with subscriptions, and similar. And if before they were doing everything in their homegrown system, you can take care of authentication, but what about the other stuff? So how do you help them to deal with that? And this is like the most uh, obvious uh, part, but there are things that are subtler. Like we had customers which, uh, instead of uh, asking for username and password, they actually needed to have a username, national uh, ID, and uh, PIN. So three things instead of two. If you are using uh, something out of the box, uh, usually you just have two little fields. So what are you going to do? So those are some examples of ways in which uh, things can go sideways. And of course, uh, uh, I see that some of you were uh, already in the session earlier. There is also the aspect about uh, authorization. Like if you are in a simple world, in a, what you see is, what, is all there is. I demonstrate this from uh, um, behavioral economics then uh, you can do things like airbag, ABAC, and similar, and somewhat statically, you can describe your authorization rules. But in fact, very often, it's a luxury you cannot afford. You might need to have actual complex logic that you need to run in order to make decisions about uh, what uh, actually, like uh, whether you need to give access, whether you need to give partial access. And those are things that typically are not supported by systems in which you do point and click. You might need to actually write code and execute it at the right time. Am I speaking too fast? No? no. no? Should I speak faster? Yes. <laughs> no. OK, so now here is my little attempt uh, at uh, being a uh, gardener. No, not really, but uh, I somewhat uh, give a more of a less blue collar but more uh, strategic outlook. One challenge that we have with uh, these kind of things is uh, if I cannot use features out of a box, then sometimes what happens is that people will end up doing, uh, um, like we'll end up going exactly in the opposite direction. So say that you have this uh, identity scenario to solve. You need to bring a technology in for making things happen for your customer. If you can't do stuff out of the box, often people go the exact opposite direction and they do everything from scratch, which is a problem. Because at that point, not only you are accommodating that last mile, but you also need to take care of the basics, the fundamentals, the essential. And those are the places where things might go wrong, and also you are reinventing the wheel because this stuff has been already taken care of. So what are the approaches that you can use for dealing with this? And uh, actually, oh no, I lost the screen. What's going to happen now? <laughs> no, I uh, disconnected it because I want to exit Slack. I'm trying to kill Slack. It won't die. <laughs> Control Alt Del, Task Manager. Where are you? <laughs> Let me find you and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel uh, reassured now that you heard me saying these things? Oh, here you are. Right click uh, and the task. Say goodbye. <laughs> All right. And once again, the miracle of projection renews itself. And uh, we can see the screen again. OK. Sorry for a little break. So here there is uh, uh, the gamut of the things that you can do. On the lower quadrant, there is uh, I roll my sleeves and I do everything from scratch. So say that uh, in this point of my diagram, I have complete control 
but I'm writing everything from scratch. Like I'm opening my, I, opening my ID, adding studio dot uh, o, or like whatever other uh, thing you use for your language of choice, and I start coding. And of course, uh, think uh, of how thick the vertical stack of development for identity is. Think of an enormous amount of things that could go wrong. Sure, you can do whatever you want, but it's super hard. So the next step is to use uh, some kind of uh, SDK. Say that I take an SDK which takes care of signature, takes care of the parsing tokens. Uh, so it's something that somewhat uh, makes things easier. So I have a nice step in the other direction, but I lose a bit of control. As in, uh, if uh, I have only a certain set uh, of signature algorithms and the thing, that's the thing I have to do. As soon as I want something else, I need to drop down. So I still have a lot of control, like mixing and matching, but uh, it's still, uh, um, I would say, a, a lot of control, but it's still hard. I have to write code. So the next step in which you go up significantly is when you use uh, in, uh, a product. Like say that I have uh, ADFS or similar side and server, something that runs on a machine I control, which uh, implements some scenario out of the box. And uh, it gives you my flexibility to provision applications, uh, describe rules, uh, all, all of these kind of things. But in terms of uh, complete uh, control, I have significantly less. Let's say that there is a garden variety of scenarios, uh, and uh, I need to live within the wiggle room of these. The the thing that is uh, difficult with that stuff is uh, there is a hard barrier, which I like to call the deployment barrier, which I never know how to position. Of course, it always ends in the wrong place. Which is basically a barrier you cannot break in terms of usability when you are using such a product. And that barrier is the barrier that the marketing of most of the companies that are presenting here bugged you for the last uh, half decade, which is uh, if you run your own services, even if you're running on virtualized hardware, you own running that stuff. You own the VMs, you own patching these things, you own having a little cluster and sharing whatever memory you need to share. So there is a tax to pay for running your own stuff. So not ideal. Now, what if we go from the other direction? Let's take uh, the other side of a diagram. And let's choose a different color. Say that I start on the exact opposite side. I have uh, no control whatsoever. Say that I'm using a SaaS application. My company uses a SaaS application for managing uh, travel, for example. I have no control. Both guys decide what are the identity providers they trust. They decide what the flows are and similar. But I have exactly zero work to do. Like administrators might have uh, some problem, but we are developers. We don't care about what the admins need to do. So, <laughs> oh, sorry, I tend to be uh, dismissive uh, that way. How many of you guys are developers? All right. How many of you are administrators? <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Luckily, in this conference, there is no room for adding the comments. So, although <laughs> <laughs> I guess that uh, <laughs> we might uh, meet on Twitter. But anyway, I don't want to give you ideas. <laughs> But anyway, like, of course, we are uh, just uh, trying to be light on a Friday morning. Um, so substantially, uh, this approach uh, is non-viable for the situations that I just described because uh, it's completely inflexible. But it is easy to use. Now, the next step is to move uh, toward uh, um, systems such as uh, of zero or others, which have uh, um, they, which are platforms, like development platforms that happen to be a service. So there is this component of uh, out-of-the-box uh, features, like one size fits all and similar, that uh, make things significantly easier to implement. Uh, sorry, uh, like uh, uh, um, easier to control, because uh, now you have all the various knobs and similar. But uh, um, they also, um, and, uh, and they, um, also you needed to make more work. Let's say that uh, from no option, hence no work. Now, if I want to exercise some of those options, you, um, you get to uh, actually do something, like operate the screen and similar. However, the, the out-of-the-box features, like uh, I hinted earlier, very often don't cut it. 
let's say that if you are not exactly in the situations where the implicit assumptions listed are satisfied, then I can't do this. And so the way in which uh, this gets solved is uh, by providing, uh, and here making different paths, because uh, different vendors make different things, the, to provide uh, higher and higher degrees of customization. So you can have uh, little switches uh, or like fields in which you provide uh, different values, you opt for different flows. So something as simple as uh, I want to use this particular O flow versus this other one. And it goes uh, farther and farther in granularity and gives you more and more control. But here, there is also another barrier, which I like to call the coding barrier, which is also very difficult to position. Oh, fantastic. This time I positioned it almost where I wanted. There is a limit to the things that you can do point and click or to the things that you can do with uh, domain-specific scripting. Like many products uh, give you languages for doing things like uh, manipulating claims and attributes and similar. But sometimes you need to bring uh, the SDK from PayPal because one of the things you need to do is integrating with a payment. And that uh, uh, SDK is not written in a script and language. It's written in TypeScript, in JavaScript. So if your product doesn't allow you to actually embed code, then there is a, a barrier in terms of control that you cannot cross. So the only way of crossing this thing is uh, to actually add code. And then, of course, uh, here you go toward uh, the harder to implement because it's code. But the main point, the key, is that uh, you do this only for the last mile. Like uh, if you are using this kind of services, checking the nonce when I'm doing an OpenID Connect flow is something that is being taken care of. You don't need to worry about it. Or uh, if uh, the OF2 uh, working group wakes up uh, from the wrong side of the bed and decides that implicit flow is no longer fashionable, and now you've got to absolutely do the code flow in Pixie, someone on your behalf will uh, do the necessary changes so that uh, under the hood this actually occurs. And so now you are again fashionable and you are uh, matching the guidance without you having to write that actual code. But if as part of this you had to uh, write some uh, payment code or some uh, subscription management and similar, that actually remains uh, in place without, without being affected by this particular aspect. Now compare what would happen if you'd be on the red side of the diagram in which instead uh, you are doing everything from scratch. So anything you touch is going to touch the entire system. So basically that's the, um, that's the idea behind this thing. Uh, yeah, and I already said this. <laughs> All right. So here, I, uh, from the rest of the time, how much time? Eh, not a lot. Uh, I'm going to uh, discuss what uh, a system that uh, matches with what I described looks like. And uh, strange enough, that system is going to be of zero, but it just happens to be the one that uh, I know. But technically, you can do it from any system which matches with... Uh, properties, which is exactly zero. It's just us. <laughs> Can we take this out of the recording? Otherwise, <laughs> and they will tell me that I do say, I don't do so speech. I just like to brag. But anyway, so from a high level, uh, any system, we, like forget about extensibility. Any system that would help you to do authentication from the uh, consumer, the developer, the just use it point of view, if you don't want to opt in to any of these things, is going to look very much like this guy. You have uh, your client, which comes in to the system. Yeah, like here, I'm modeling the case in which there is a user that uh, comes into play, but uh, you can imagine that this works also for programmatic flows in which there is uh, no interaction whatsoever. You come in, you'll be presented with some experience, you can expect uh, that you'll have uh, somewhere in, uh, a set of attributes that will come into play somehow, and then uh, you'll get back uh, whatever artifact is required for the protocol of choice, and then this artifact will be happily delivered to your resource. How many of you guys use Python? All right, so this logo doesn't get completely to waste. How many of you use Node? Slightly more. How about XP.NET? Didn't you guys say that you are developers? 
What do you do? I got PHP, Scala, Lua, uh, JavaScript, of course. Uh, so Lua, yeah, fantastic. Right. You guys are awesome. Okay, but anyway, the, the reason for which I say this is that uh, with our designers, like they decided to put Python probably because they like the logo. Then uh, <laughs> <it's, laughs> I think that there are more popular systems that we could have used there, but doesn't matter. Okay, so this one is what it would look like with no customization at all. And now avert your eyes, because like, uh, this is the level of, uh, um, how to say, complexity that uh, we needed to bake into the system in order to address many of the scenarios that I described earlier. The good news is that, again, remember, and here I'm going to ruin your plot of taking a picture of it. Whoops, no. <laughs> it's no longer on the screen. What are we going to do? <laughs> Actually. You're welcome, sir. I have an entire block, and I don't want to put it in my uh, baggage. So whomever wants it at the end is going to get it. And if you don't want it, you're going to get it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. Okay. So but the good news is that uh, this is a full sprawl, but uh, in fact, uh, it's very rare that you have to use all of those uh, extensibility points. Like for us, uh, that we have to maintain it and develop it and evolve it and similar. It's a useful view. But for you, we'll see in a second that uh, as we focus on specific scenarios, there are areas that you take advantage of and areas that you can happily ignore. Like even if they're there, it doesn't really add much complexity about it. Um, okay, so here let's look at some scenarios. Like one example of this, uh, like a, 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 a classic thing that is most painful in my experience is uh, when uh, you need to extract users from places which uh, somewhat resist from uh, using uh, those credentials in the context of a standard-based flow. And uh, the classic step is uh, I have the sprawl of all the uh, identity providers that I support, and uh, the one that I care about isn't there. So let me see if I can. Um, what's the best way of showing this? Probably I should just hit the website and show you. Let's see. Zero, blah, blah, blah. Again, yeah, no, yeah. Okay, so just to give you an idea, here we have like a long sprawl, uh, including Apple, of uh, identity providers. And uh, if my identity provider is in this list or in any of the other many lists we have in the dashboard, fantastic. What happens if uh, it isn't? In the next best case, I can actually use uh, some open protocol to talk with them. So a good example to this uh, would be um, whether like my provider is an open ID connect provider, contrary to all the other speakers, I do have the ability to zoom. I don't know why no one zoomed, but also, do you have a motion sequence? <laughs> you have now, right? Yeah. So uh, this is uh, a classic case uh, in which uh, if say that I don't have an idea. <laughs> Sorry, it was uh, entirely unintentional. The thing is that I'm in a conundrum. This is uh, a uh, thing for doing a physics experiment. Like, see? So I cannot rest this thing here, so I have to keep it in my hand. But this thing is sensitive, so as soon as I touch it, things happen. So I needed to hold it the right way, like the iPhone 4. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Mr. Wozniak, otherwise he might decide not to talk. <laughs> but anyway, uh, here the thing is, uh, uh, say that my provider, I know they support OpenID Connect, uh, here using uh, this kind of extensibility, which is still not code yet, but still pretty powerful, can just come in here and describe, uh, actually just point to the description of a service, and then uh, magic will happen and I'll be able to integrate. However, unfortunately, that's not always something available to me. And uh, there is uh, a recent example of this, uh, which is uh, um, the Apple sign-in. Uh, the sign-in with Apple is uh, almost open to connect. They got so close. But uh, it's like in some uh, bizarre universe in which everything is slightly different, like your cousin is blonde instead of black hair or uh, curly. There, they did slight changes. So if you take uh, the out-of-box integration with OpenID Connect, you would not be able to connect. 
but there is a, a, the next level of a granularity for integration, which we find uh, in this particular case uh, in the extensions. And here, I, I'm not telling you the details of the, um, how to get in there, because that's not my goal. Here, I'm not trying to get you to use of zero. I'm just giving you examples of uh, kind of extens extensibility points that help you to address that particular scenario. And in particular, in here, we have this feature called uh, uh, custom social connection, in which uh, you can actually build an uh, OAuth client. Like OpenID Connect is really designed to interoperate as a nice format in similar, as long as the provider matches the requirements. In this particular case, instead, the OAuth is a way loser. Like uh, it just tells you, it just teaches you how to be a client. And with this extensibility point, uh, substantially, you can create an OAuth to client, and you can actually perform calls to one particular API that you will use for uh, actually pulling out information about the user and hopefully about the transaction, given that doing this uh, typically is a uh, bad practice because uh, it's conducive of a um, confused deputy attack. But it is uh, an uh, integration point that you can use uh, um, pretty uh, easily. Again, there, here there, you start seeing a bit of code, like this uh, fetch uh, user, uh, user profile script is a good example of that, which I don't have enough resolution to show, but never mind. It's here. You can see just a little bit of code. <laughs> ah, I managed. Uh, so here is basically where you would write your little JavaScript function for making that call. So it's the first place where you see that the ability of running code in process in your authorization server makes the difference. And in fact, before we did this uh, amazing feat of engineering, if I can say this myself, uh, of uh, adding uh, the ability to sign in with Apple out of the box. We had a blog post showing how you can do the, uh, use that feature for connecting to Apple and somewhat work around some of their shortcomings of, uh, in the support of the protocol. But this is all child's play in respect to some other stuff, such as, for example, the classic problem of the unmovable database. How many of you guys have uh, uh, credential stores uh, on premises? All right, thank you. A few years ago, these would have been most of the room. So now the fact that it was uh, about 10% uh, is remarkable. But still, very often when this stuff didn't move yet, that's because uh, there is an excellent reason for. Either you cannot afford the downtime and uh, you have uh, username and their passwords hashed, because it's a bad idea to save them in the clear. But that means that if you just try to do a wholesale move, all the users will have to change their password. Unacceptable. Uh, or uh, you might have uh, some strong reasons for keeping uh, the database the place it is. Like uh, I worked in the past with uh, industries with high risk uh, uh, assessments, like uh, avionics, like uh, uh, stuff in which like human li lives are at stake. And so there are like, uh, certifications and similar which uh, establish that uh, uh, your database uh, comply with those things and so moving it may be possible technically but is extremely expensive and you are busy doing other stuff so you don't do it so in general the idea is that uh, um, you might be unable to make uh, this uh, this move so here there's the way in which uh, you can cope with that and here is my first extensibility point the idea is that uh, along with all the various uh, external identity providers with whom you can talk, either because they are out of the box or because they talk a protocol that you know, you must provide ways, if you want to deal with that particular scenario, to talk to the database directly on its own terms as opposed to the golden standard of using uh, open protocols and similar. So a practical example of this, again using of zero, is uh, this uh, feature in which uh, um, instead of uh, expecting the users to be all copied in my, um, in my system, in my new system, what I do is in fact uh, declare that I want to still use my own database. And at that point, we come back to this idea of the ability to inject code. I can actually provide a couple of scripts 
one for validating the credential of an incoming user, the other for extracting the attributes of this user, I can strategically call these scripts at the right time in my, uh, in my pipeline. So imagine that uh, here I'm having uh, my user coming in and getting their username and password in my page. Now, instead of checking it in my own uh, cloud credential, I can actually now execute the script and actually go to retrieve. Uh, let's see if I can steal a database for another slide. I knew I had one somewhere. Here it is, database. Uh, uh, uh. Sorry, I like to do the slides at the very last moment. So that when they ask me, oh, where is your slide? I thought, well, wait until the end of the presentation and you'll have my slides. <laughs> it is literally what I do. OK, so now we have our little database in here. And the idea is that uh, if I call at the right time in the flow, I can retrieve, the, I can check the user, I can retrieve my information, and then I can issue a token and return it in whatever standard protocol you were using. And uh, so at that point, uh, I leveraged, I squeezed more return investment of my existing databases, but uh, now I'm free to innovate. If I want to have a mobile client that uses uh, uh, OpenID Connect uh, and uh, iOS uh, for uh, making calls, but I still want to use the users that are in there, now I'm able to do so, even uh, with the fact that this thing didn't support any protocol at all. And added the bonus, well, there is this feature that we call lazy migration, which substantially means uh, Whenever I do this thing, I retrieve your user from your local database, but I also save it back in, my, in the one in the cloud. And then at that point, I just keep this contraption running for, I don't know, 6, 9, 12 months, and my users migrate themselves. So the problem of the username and password, having to change the password, here doesn't apply. They just use their old password. We just happen to copy them up at the right time. And then once you cross the threshold, you just switch off uh, the local database. If that's something that you want to do, you don't have to do it. And then at that point, migration done and no calls to IT because uh, what happened to my password? Pretty cool. Any questions so far? No. I was hoping someone would ask, so I'd say sorry about questions only at the end. <laughs> Mark, you didn't fall into my trap. OK. Other things that uh, you typically find, this one, I'm sure you all found it, is uh, things like uh, customization of a UI. This one is like a pretty, uh, a pretty easy one, as in uh, um, I just want the look and feel of my sign-in to change. And this one is uh, super common. <coughs> So um, just to give you a, a super quick taste of this. Like uh, we have uh, the default experiences, which uh, you would uh, expect from any identity provider. So um, when you go and you do sign in, you'll have like uh, your uh, generic dialogue. And uh, in general, we have uh, like this. Uh, if you are interested in uh, demonstrating the classic flows, uh, that you get uh, in um, that you get uh, when you are using the out of the box experience, we put together a little educational tool which happens to describe what we do uh, in of zero, but you can actually apply it to anyone. Like if someone wants to know what the sign in flow that I would do from a device would look like, you can use this tool for basically um, getting things done. And here, let me do a little uh, piece of magic. Can I see the name of your company, sir? Let's see what happens. Fiserv. Fiserv. <coughs> loading, loading. Loading, loading. You might not have uh, your logo online. Oh, no. Yeah. Which one is it? Which one do you want? Uh, first one. The first one. Yeah. All right. So at this point, here you can see your uh, logo. Very complicated logo. <laughs> 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 Extremely sophisticated. Actually, you know what? Given that it's orange, let me give you an orange t-shirt, oh, awesome. which you can sell to others as in like, oh, it's our company t-shirt. <laughs> 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 
And the, here, like uh, in the event in which you don't need to uh, customize anything, here, for example, you can use this tool for saying, okay, how would uh, a uh, um, one-time password flow would look like? Or like uh, how if I do a device login, which is kind of like a bit of a complicated flow, you can just show them how this thing works. So this is the case in which you don't need to change, uh, um, to change anything. But say that you do want to customize the experience. Uh, typically, here are the various uh, products that you'll use uh, will have some degree of customization out of the box if they are worth their name. And here, we are no exception. Like uh, the default is that you can place the logo of your company, you can uh, change the basic colors and similar. However, very often you will need to go significantly further. Let's say that uh, marketing departments uh, will have uh, ideas about uh, what pixel will drive uh, more clicks or going deeper in the funnel and similar, and will blame you if uh, the, their customers don't sign up. So you better give them as much control over the look and feel as possible. There is also another aspect here, which is uh, when you sign in with multiple, uh, pot potentially with multiple providers, uh, you might need to have different strategies for uh, helping the user to go through the right experience and choose the right identity provider. Out of the box, the brute force approach is what we call the NASCAR, which is substantially showing a button for each and every provider that you are willing to accept in your app. That it doesn't always work. And so an emerging system that uh, people typically take advantage of is the is identifier first, in which the user first types his or her in a, a email or identifier, and based on the domain, the page somewhat knows where to send them. And so that is a very common customization that people want to do. And so here I'll just give you a very concrete example of that. I just have. Uh, the ability using the system to paste any HTML and JavaScript that I want in the page. So I can control every pixel and I can do even active things, such as, for example, changing the way in which I do home RAM discovery. I think I blubbered long enough for this to propagate. And voila, see, I just uh, refreshed and now I'm using uh, custom HTML and I also changed the way in which I'm authenticating. Note that everything else in my uh, pipeline didn't change. I just placed code specifically in there. So once again, a proof point of the fact that you can, um, that when you use code, you, you have the ability to cross that last mile uh, more easily. Okay, so these are, uh, I won't spend much time on it uh, because uh, I'm using potentially the same mechanism. Um, like uh, if we had customers that literally needed to have uh, three fields instead of two. So we did a combination of uh, custom uh, page that I've shown earlier and uh, custom database, as uh, I mentioned earlier. And both of things came together to enable that particular scenario. And that's the one that I can talk about, but there are so many that uh, you wouldn't believe. Um, yeah, another thing that uh, uh, happens uh, often is that uh, when uh, you sign up people, you want to exercise more control over what you would get uh, from your garden variety of sign up, in which you just have a click here for uh, getting registered. So for example, we have uh, customers that want to have uh, uh, only uh, emails from work. Like if you show up with a Hotmail or Gmail uh, or Yahoo, they will not allow you to sign up because it's like they do a business, so they need to have uh, custom domains. And so the way in which they achieved this was by um, taking advantage of uh, another stage that we have in our pipeline, this uh, pre-sign up and post-sign up. Those are rules, that's uh, JavaScript, that uh, literally runs when uh, you lead people through the sign up experience. And here you can do whatever, like uh, whatever logic uh, you can write in JavaScript can be run in here. So if you have also like a uh, risk assessment factors, if you want to uh, verify something other than the classic uh, email and similar, you have full freedom to do so, which is uh, very handy. And that's uh, at the um, sign up level. Then uh, afterwards, when you actually sign in, still in the context of uh, um, managing uh, user uh, lifecycle, very often you'll have uh, 
even dealing with users that come from multiple sources, which typically means that they will come up uh, with different attributes, like the original identity provider knows different things about, uh, the, um, about the user. And so uh, here you have an opportunity to normalize these uh, sets so that your application doesn't need to worry about whether users come from a source versus another. Here you can have logic that can, uh, I say, um, now I lack uh, the term in English because it's uh, already 11 in the morning on a Friday. Um, you can uh, uh, extend, it's not exactly the word that I wanted, but it will come tonight. I'm about to fall asleep. I say, ah, that was the word. <laughs> uh, you can uh, um, integrate uh, the, what you get uh, supplement. I don't know. Uh, the, the set that you get from identity provider with the extra settings that you want. And uh, you can get these attributes from either specific areas that we reserve for saving uh, extra user attributes, either specific for the user and the application, or just for the user, or you can pretty much do whatever. Like you can call any API, you can extract from any identity source. And once again, the goal here is to decouple your application from any differences or any potential changes that might occur. Again, let me bring in the Apple example because it's fashionable. Today in Apple, you get out very little. Like their documentation say that you can actually retrieve attributes, but you can send them the scopes that request these until you're blue in the face, and you still don't get anything. I think that's because it's a beta and that you see they still need to turn this thing on. But imagine that you are working in an existing system and you need to integrate with such a, an uh, identity provider and your application still needs those attributes. Here you can add the rules in this pipeline which uh, modify the tokens that you are about to issue to add whatever attributes are required or subtract if you want to. Sometimes there are things that the application isn't supposed to know and you can actually pull them out. So in general, you can have a full control over a, a digest of what will be sent out, which is very handy. And once again, these can be done in uh, uh, domain-specific rules if you so choose, uh, but uh, you are limited with what you can do. Like you can do a bit of claims arithmetic, like I like to call it, but uh, if you want, for example, to call external sources or uh, do calculations, stuff that requires code, then you do need this kind of solution. And um, yeah, here uh, time is running out very quickly. So uh, let me just uh, close uh, on uh, one of my favorite things. As identity professionals, uh, we typically have a very clear categories in mind. And for us, authentication is uh, a fundamental capability of a system. But for a lot of like mugglers, as in people that don't do identity wizardry, that thing is just something between their users and the thing that they are selling. And everything that happens in the middle is uh, the same functionality. So you might have existing systems with people that uh, sell API access, and they might give uh, to people API keys. And those API keys might represent both the user to which this thing has been assigned and the billing relationship between that user and your service. So they might use this thing for saying, ah, yeah, I see that you're calling me this API, so I know your user attributes. And I also know that you paid this month versus, you know, you didn't pay, so I'm not going to let you through. And so when they decide that they want to move away from that thing, then now they have a problem that, sure, you take care of authentication, but what about the rest? And the idea is that here you can do the same stuff that I said earlier. Like uh, I can have uh, any logic that uh, gets run in the context of serving an authentication request. And uh, I can, uh, for example, expect uh, custom parameters. So say that uh, now they, they move to this new standard-based system and they add as an extra parameter in their request the old API key. Now, I no longer use that API key for authentication, but if I want to just take this key and call their, call in, their former service that told them uh, this guy paid this month or not, and uh, just reuse that logic without having to rewrite anything, and especially without losing the, the business flow that we already have today, which every one of our company already understands. So the ability of uh, passing custom parameters uh, to extend the message 
and the ability to process things uh, in that respect, really, really powerful and very hard to achieve in any other way. Because once again, think of a system which is just geared to implement OpenID or implement OAuth, as opposed to a system that empowers a developer to use identity as a tool for the goals that they have, which is not necessarily to implement that protocol. It's like the protocol is part of a solution, it's not the solution. Whereas for us, uh, as identity experts, very often we have this uh, focusing illusion and we don't see this aspect. There is uh, yet another flavor, which is, uh, again, very hard to achieve without this kind of extensibility, which is uh, sometimes people will need to have uh, custom interactions in the context of authentication. Like what I said earlier, as in I'm passing a key and I'm just making a check, doesn't really affect the experience. But there might be times in which you do want to affect the experience. Imagine a user that is coming in and uh, the token that you are returning will be used for accessing a document library. And in order to see those documents, the user need to have uh, signed an NDA, for example. Now you could have uh, the user go before showing up for these documents and uh, do whatever they need to do for getting their NDA in advance. And then you might need to go and do all your various checks. But wouldn't it be awesome to have the ability to embed this experience as part of the authentication? Say that your user comes in, your, your rules establish that this user is accessing this document library for the very first time, and then instead of refusing access and saying go somewhere else, because the user at this point already authenticated, you already know about the user, you can actually use this uh, uh, loop, which we call uh, redirect rules, in which uh, you can call an external page. You can show whatever that page uh, wants to show. And then there is uh, a protocol for coming back to the flow. And at this point, uh, say that you can ins insert their DocuSign. So I sign in. The system sees that I need an NDA. So I'm redirected to DocuSign. I do whatever I need to do with DocuSign. I get redirected back in the rules, and I run my rules again. And now I can use the DocuSign APIs, given that this is code. So I can take their SDK, and I can call their APIs to verify whether this user signed or not. And depending on that, I can give them a token and say, have fun, or block them saying, sorry, you've got to do this thing uh, in advance. And when you do this in this pipeline, now you can use it everywhere. Like if a user is uh, using a mobile phone or any other device, the fact that this thing is taken care of as part of this makes it completely ubiquitous. Like you don't need to worry about this aspect in your resource or in your client. Super powerful. I actually have a, a demo that shows this with PayPal, in which we have uh, the, uh, these calls uh, in our post authenticator to go to PayPal and see if the guy paid. And if he didn't, we actually go on a little static page to make them pay and then come back. But I didn't check this morning if it still works. So at 1 minute and 42, 41, 39, uh, I'm not going to risk my luck. But let me, um, yeah. So uh, if you want to know more about this stuff, you can hit the uh, uh, of zero um, portal. And if there, from there, you can find out there's documentation, there's everything. If uh, you want to talk with a human, or a really, really good uh, AI, which you will not be able to tell it's an AI. It will look like a human. <laughs> no, it's a human. Uh, at teamofzero.com, and if you want to uh, feel the stinging uh, feeling of uh, not getting a reply, you can send me an email. <laughs> also because I'm really, really bad at email. But if you tweet for me, I'm uh, publicly shamed, so I'm usually compelled to answer pretty quickly. And uh, so the takeaway are uh, very, very rarely you'll have a luxury to have actually taking your platonic idea of an identity system and apply it in the wild. And uh, the thing is that uh, that's not a good reason for giving up and saying, OK, I'm going to write everything from scratch. No. You can use systems that have uh, extensibilities at the right place so that you can write only the code that you need and you let uh, the professionals take care of the basics. And uh, there are many places where you can do extensibility and many different styles for applying extensibility. And uh, usually you will not need them all. You'll need a specific subset. So evaluate. Uh, and uh, here I'm not saying that uh, 
you'll always need to use uh, a system like ours. In general, like, think of that little diagram and think where your challenges are and uh, see where you live in that uh, part. And for me, the most uh, uh, flexible thing is what we are doing, in which you have a service, so everything out of the box, platform as a service, but then you have a last mile, but I'm biased. So that's why I had that little diagram in which uh, you guys can decide where you best operate. And I guess that's it. Thank you. <laughs>